at him. Range is up on Norfolk. That's Ron Clark looking at him. Jazzy on, in the lead, the Frenchman. Norfolk comes up beside him. And on the outside, Dellinger comes up for the United States. Bill Dellinger jumps into the lead. This is a two-time Olympian. This is his third Olympics. He's 30 years old, came out of retirement to make this one. This is the first time he's made the finals in the Olympics. He failed in 56 and 60 to make it. Now he's come on the outside to lead Michael Jazzy. That's Bill Dellinger of the United States out ahead right now. actually started out being a football player in high school and he did that for two or three years until somebody saw him in a PE class and got him out for got him out for cross country running and then he wins the state title and uh, in that track he was very very competitive if you look at his entire career as a runner he rarely won a race necessarily by a lot because he would just compete against the people that he was he was the opposite of pre, who would go out and run and run from the word go, you know, and yet and yet Dillinger wouldn't do that. And pre loved to race and to run. Bill didn't. After the 1960 Olympics, when he went to Rome, he took two or three, three or three years off and just ran on his own, and then came back and ran in the in the Olympics. He retired from running competitively and he, so he got involved with his cross-country team at Thurston and he started running more and more with those guys and he had I think he had a couple pretty decent runners that needed to be pushed a little harder than the others so he started doing longer and longer runs with them and pretty soon he started getting that like I might be able to do this again and he would my mom would drive him up on Sundays way up a logging road up in East Springfield about 20 miles from the house that was his big run on Sundays and then he'd run to school in the mornings and run home he started doing that and he's like you know what I think I think I'll try out for forget what meet it was to just get a qualifying time to try to see if he could even get into the Olympic trials and I think he ran a great time and he just kind of continually started doing that and then made the Olympic team and you know he's still coaching and teaching full-time at Thurston and uh, yeah I think that's how that happened he's gonna have to tear now if he's gonna run and there they go the bell left Jazzy looks around to see who's coming up on him Jazzy out ahead and the Russian right at his shoulder that's Dutov coming up on him Dellinger's third Northworth is fourth Scholl is fifth Bailey is sixth Scholl is moving up Scholl on the outside. Scholl is coming up on Norfolk. Jazzy's out ahead. Scholl is third. Bailey coming up in black behind. Scholl. Jazzy's out of front. Scholl is closing in on him. Scholl is passing Norfolk. Scholl is second. He's closing up on Jazzy. They're coming around the last turn. Here's Scholl trying to catch Jazzy. Jazzy out in front. Scholl coming up on the inside. That's Scholl racing by. Scholl of the United States is leading. Scholl is coming in. Scholl is going to win it. Scholl is winning the 5,000. And it's the first American ever to win the 5,000. And I believe he's going And Dillinger got third. He wins the bronze medal. He ran that morning and went out because it puts you in a comfort zone of what you're used to doing. Did he run hard? Probably not. Probably was, and it was, but it was two or three miles, you know, on that morning. You get in that habit, and that's good for you to do. And you either have good habits so you don't. And if you've got good habits, you follow through with doing that. People don't realize that although he's a distance coach, he started out at Oregon being the field events coach. And because Bowerman was there and he 
uh, hired Bill as his assistant, but he needed people to coach that. He had a great relationship with Bowerman. Uh, remember that he ran for Bowerman, you know, as a collegian. Um, then he came back and was his assistant coach, and Bowerman trained him, although a lot of before 64 might have been him doing his own training because he was off and away. They had a great relationship. It soured when uh, Nike got going and Bill invented a shoe. Um, and it was with the web concept. Nike had their air shoe at the time, air cushioned. He offered it to Nike and Nike had the air design so they weren't interested in it and Adidas accepted it. And you can't blame Bill for the fact that Nike wouldn't accept it, but Bowerman did. And they had been with Nike up until then and Bill had great friends at Adidas He found out what it means to compete at the national level and choke on it, and uh, I, I don't think we'll ever see him do that again. I mean, choke. I think some of our young runners like Alberto and Rudy, uh, Bruce Nelson in the 1500, uh, will all come back uh, to score many points for us in the future in the NC2A. We all know that Bill Barman was a great innovator and, and was a co-founder of Nike. You know, a lot of the innovations that he made. And Bill Dellinger also, though, was, a, was an innovator. And, and I can remember our, our freshman year in cross country that uh, he would get our shoes, that whatever uh, shoe we were wearing, like a track spike, and we would hand those in to him, and then he would take them away, and then a couple days later he'd come back and he had put a waffle bottom on the heel. So, which was really important, because you had the spikes up in front, which kept your forefoot you know, anchored to the ground, but, Often, if you landed on your heel on a slippery surface, you might slide before you ever even got to your spikes. So he came back with that, uh, you know, waffle portion of the heel. And, you know, my recollection is that I didn't see anybody else doing that before Bill did it with us. And obviously, Bill Barman was experimenting with the whole waffle concept, and that included a waffle for the entire, you know, bottom of a shoe. But, uh, you know, I believe that Bill came up with the idea first of putting that just on a track spike. It got a little difficult one year when we were in Louisiana and all of our athletes were jumpers that were in Nikes or that were, or almost all of them or whatever, you know, that year. And the Nike rep kind of noticed that and that became a, a little bit testy and whatever. But um, eventually, we came back and we went with Nike, and I don't know how Bowerman um, came, to, uh, came to an understanding of that. I know that in the writing of the books about Pre, uh, like the Without Limits movie and the Pre movie that Pat Tyson was, was with, that ended up being more of a movie about Bowerman than about Dillinger. And in fact, Dillinger was the hands-on coach that that did it all, and Bowerman was the was the head coach. But in reality, the day-to-day coach was Bill Dellinger. He's the guy that recruited him. Remember, Bowerman didn't recruit. He sent his coaches, but Bowerman himself only wrote a letter to Pree. Well, it was Dillinger that went over to Coos Bay and recruited him, and it was Dillinger that was with him all the time when um, Bowerman was the head coach, and Bowerman would. Uh, would butt in and coach because he was the head coach and he was a, a attack, an assertive person or whatever. And so he did, Bowerman did a lot with Pre, but the real day-to-day coach was Bill Dellinger. After Prefontaine's defeat by Burkle, do you expect a better performance this week or in the week to come? Well, of course, Pre is competing this weekend in, in Los Angeles against Berkeley again, and I know that Pre is looking forward to that comp- competition, and uh, he's unhappy that he got beat back in Washington, D.C. I know that he is also looking forward to running a good two-mile up in Portland, where he has won, as I've stated earlier, three times before.
went to the meet and it was a great, I mean, I just remember it was like perfectly blue sky, no wind. There was a ton of people there and I would run around out. So I'd go out and try to look for baseballs and basketballs, but I knew when Pre was running, you know, so I was like, oh, I got to get back. So, I, you know, we always, everybody would watch Pre. And then he won his race and then we went home. And in the morning, my mom got us up and she sat me and my two brothers on the couch. And she's like, I got some bad news to tell you. And we're like, what? She said, Pre died last night in a car crash. That whole thing kind of was like time just stopped. You know, when I look back at it, I just remember sitting on the couch here and then he died and then it was like, Psh. He was a great storyteller, so he got along with everybody. When you started talking to him, he, he knew uh, had a great memory for his old stories and people would be telling him jokes and stories and so he could repeat those and he was great in a social setting. He's talking to me. $20 Well, the hardest thing for, uh, after his stroke, he couldn't get his thoughts out real well. What people didn't realize was that his mind was going 100 miles a minute, you know, and he could hear all these stories, but he couldn't get them out. And then I remember getting this call, I think it was from Merrill, Hey, your dad's had this stroke, and we don't know. I mean, it's kind of like he's, it could go either way. And it's just, it was like shocking because my dad is like Iron Man. I just thought that he would be untouchable. I mean, the stuff that he was doing in his late 60s was like, holy bet, you know what I mean? <laughs> Jesus. So, anyways, for, so it was quite a shock. And for quite a while there, I mean, it was kind of on the edge that, you know, they didn't know if he was actually going to survive it. And he did, obviously, but I, it, his competitiveness is, his stroke just brought out that whole, I think anybody else would not have survived it. And to function the way he's functioned, I mean, to drive and to not, I mean, he's still, I mean, how many years later? No cane, no nothing. I'll try to reach out and grab his arm. No, no, I'm good. He's like, Dad, <laughs> he's so stubborn, but. Anyways, it's he's it's it's very sad what happened because what happened, the saddest thing to me is that he's lost his voice and he had the greatest stories and I've tried to tell my sons the stories that he has told me, and I mean he was just so funny and he had the greatest laugh. He still has the greatest laugh, and you can still see it in his eyes. <laughs> but I like it the one that the, you pull. oh like. I'm a fresh I'm a freshman at Oregon, and uh, I heard Bill was a top pool player, and I played pretty good pool 
for for my age group and and I decided Bill at that time Bill there was some things about hair going on I had I had hair at the time and I like to keep it long so I figured somehow a challenge Bill to a pool game so I could keep my hair the winning and if I lost Bill would um, take me to his barber and cut it the way he likes it. This was all my own ideas. Bill didn't do anything, and he just looked at me as I'm challenging him, boasting how good I am and what the wage is going to be. So Bill sat at his desk, just looked. I don't know what he was thinking, but he, I couldn't read him at all. And he agreed that we'd play pool at the student union that Friday at 5 o'clock. I still remember. So the whole team was all good, because I beat everybody out the Oregon team at that point. So they all think I have a shot at beating Bill. And uh, so I had a prox. We got there, and I had approximately 40 to 50 guys come in there to watch Bill get whipped. And uh, so Bill comes, strolls. It's quite the actor, Bill. Did. He comes in approximately 15 minutes late, and he doesn't want to warm up. Doesn't He flatly says he doesn't earn the right to warm up because he's late. So I let him, sh uh, mistakenly, I let him shoot first. And I never got a second shot on the first rack of eight ball. And it looked clearly, you could see after the first rack, who was going, who's in charge here. And I turn around to start the second rack. And we break and Bill runs half the table. I look up at my fans and they're all heading towards the exit. <laughs> they didn't want to sit around, watch Bill win another championship. And sure enough, by the end of the second rack, I was done. It was supposed to be two out of three, but there was no third game. And it was a quite quick two racks, I may add. And I uh, had my head down, and Bill slowly walked past, popped me on the and says, I'll see you in my office Monday, 9 o'clock, to get your hair cut. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, not, that's not the whole story. Most places, that would be the story. This is not the headline. The headline is, my coach was down the road playing pool for about a half an hour to an hour, having a cocktail or two, getting warmed up. And I'm sitting around, and I let the, my coach, being a nice idiot from New York, I got hustled by an Oregonian. I wasn't laughing at that time, motherfucker. He, I didn't find out two years later that he was drinking. He had all set me up. He didn't even tell me. He hustled me the whole time. So I never had a shot. The, the deck was stacked. Thank you, Coach. Hey, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> term. Um, I think um, if there's ever a, you know, a true uh, graphic or a banner or a monument that says something about the three bills, um, he, he's, he'll be of equal stature to the other two. And I think that's a, that, would, that would be accurate and appropriate. I hope that happens. The Oregon track program is as, as modern and, and, uh, in, uh, and impactful as, as it is today. Um, might have been even more so back in, the, in, their, in their time. So there was a, a, a moment in time that I really, really uh, value. It was uh, in 1971 when we were uh, it was cross-country season. Uh, we had a, a decent team, um, but the Northern Division meet, which is four schools, we only got third place. So how good were we? And, uh, you know, two weeks later, Bill uh, uh, took us down to UCLA for the Pac-8, and we ended up getting second. Uh, 
And so, were we good enough to go to the NC2A championships? Uh, well, in that during that period of time, generally the conference champion goes, and second place doesn't go. Well, Pre was the was certainly going to go, and uh, but he didn't want to go by himself, so he went before the athletic director Norv Ritchie. He says to, to Norv, "If the team doesn't go, I'm not going." A bold move uh, that paid paid off because. Ten days later, we're, we're off to Knoxville, Tennessee. Coach Delner just got his six, not seven. And uh, we ended up uh, winning the national championships. And one of the uh, special moments was to see Bill in, in, in the hotel lobby uh, giving me a kind of a weird look that night when I had a, a, a bag. He didn't know what was in it. He came by and peeked in it. And there was a six pack of Colt 45 malt liquors. and. A, boatload of cigars because it was going to be our night to celebrate the NC2A championship the very first for Bill Dillinger and the very first for Oregon and uh, he, he put his hand in took one of the uh, cans out and one of the cigars out and he said you guys be good tonight remember to practice one of my principles of moderation and uh, that's a memory that I'll never ever forget. And I think that's where Dellinger really, in the end, was probably as it was at his strongest. Was uh, was worth it, was like working with Matt Centrowitz Senior, who um, just to look at him, you're going, "There's no way that guy can run under four minutes for a mile. There's no way." And uh, yet, you know, he had enough talent. And then, uh, then with uh, I think working with Dellinger, you know, uh, they they really got great results together. And he became, you know, Matt Centrowitz Senior became uh, an Olympian. I gave Bill a nickname behind his back my first year, and uh, I called him magi magi magician. I think I said it again, magician, because he gave you, you take these guys. I came from a team that had no sub four minute miles on it from Manhattan College at the time, and <clears throat> there were some top athletes there that didn't break four. And I came out to Oregon and I saw these other athletes, and they weren't half as good as the ones that I knew, and they had sub four minute miles under their belt. And I just couldn't believe that there could be a coach in the planet that could get these guys, the ones at Oregon, to run that fast. And I just left a bunch of guys that were harder working, more talented, and more determined than, than some of the ducks that were sub four minute miles. So I nicknamed him Magician, and uh, he got kids in the shape, because uh, you enjoyed it, you didn't realize how hard you're working. He always made it fun. And he had this element of uh, making it relaxing, fun, instead of psyching you up. And a lot of coaches do or intensify the, the pressure on. He made it enjoyable and less pressurized so you could run relaxed and uh, reach your potential. What I found fascinating with Bill's program is we did hard work that felt easy. And I did magnificent workouts with, with very little effort because I was enjoying his coaching style. The, uh, the environment that I was in here and he slowly systematically brought you to that level of thinking and running without you knowing it so when he gave you one of those tests you passed with flying colors and you kind of uh, had renewed confidence in yourself that you were ready for competition and uh, that's what made Bill's program very very special. <laughs>